now. So uh, I'm happy to present him for his talk, and then he'll be followed by a discussion by Jennifer, and then we'll have open questions to both of them. Okay, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me to come here and talk about our research. So how many of you guys uh, have a neuroscience background? Okay, a few. So I'm gonna talk a lot about neuroscience. For those of you who don't have a neuroscience background, I think it should be okay. I wanna encourage you, if you have a question about what I'm talking about, please uh, you know, raise your hand and we can discuss the question if it's about the science. Um, during my talk, uh, if it's questions about other issues like we discussed in the panel, maybe we can keep that at the, at the end. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, as I mentioned, I, I was actually trained as an undergraduate as a biochemist. I became very interested in the idea that you could understand life through chemistry and that uh, I grew up on a farm and there were lots of different animals around me um, and I can see that these different animals had different kinds of instincts, different kinds of personalities, different social personalities. These different species had different um, ways of behaving that was somehow organized in their brain and I knew as I was an undergraduate taking biochemistry and genetics that somehow that organization of the behavior for that particular species had to be somehow laid out in that linear sequence of A's, G's, C's, and T's that make up the genome. So from a very early age, I became fascinated by how you go from letters in a code in the DNA to an organized brain to a species typical kind of behavior. And then how do you get random mutations in that to get diversity in behavior? And that's what I've been trying to figure out. But from a biochemical level, as, as close to the molecules as I can. And I'm going to talk about social behavior. So, so my work is all about social behavior. And uh, here you can see some of the strongest kinds of social relationships that we can experience um, as humans. And these are the bonds between uh, the mother and the infant, um, as well as the, the mother and the father. Um, now, if you want to understand something about the neurobiology of the human brain, you can understand a very little by using brain scanners. You can put a person in a brain scanner and you can ask them to think about their partner or their baby or their loved one or something like that and you can see what brain areas are activated. But in no way can you figure cause, determine causality in that way. You cannot do the kinds of manipulation. This is just an observation. So if you really want to find out you know, the details of how the brain's architecture creates important behaviors or important cognitive abilities or things like that, then I think that you really need an animal model, at least for the next 100 years or so. And these are the animals that I've been studying. These are called prairie voles. These guys live in the Midwestern United States, around Illinois area. And what makes them so cool and different from other laboratory animals that people study, like mice and rats, is that these guys have a family structure very similar to our own, okay? Um, so I should mention, I forgot to, to mention something about this picture here. If you think about the biology of this, some of these behaviors are evolutionarily very ancient. So this behavior between the mother and the infant evolutionarily is very ancient. You see that across all mammals. All mammals, mothers, when they give birth, they take care of their offspring. But this relationship that you see right here is actually very rare among mammals. Only about 5% of mammals do the males and females stick together after they mate. In most animals, mating is just for re reproduction. After mating, males and females split. The females raise the babies by themselves. So humans are a little bit different. We say we have a monogamous mating strategy. That doesn't mean sexually monogamous. It means that we form partnerships. Um, so prairie voles are the same way. A male, female in the prairie, male comes across a female, they court. If the female allows that male to mate, they will mate. And when they mate, a transformation occurs in the brain so that from then on, both of these animals want to be together. They nest together. They raise their offspring together. They are partners. Now, it doesn't mean that they're always faithful. So this little pup right here, I think you heard Alex Ophir probably talk about this a few days ago, uh, but this little pup right here could not, perhaps not belong to the father who thinks it's his pup, right? Sometimes they have extra pair copulations. I'm not studying sexual monogamy here. What we are studying is the formation of a bond that makes two individuals want to be together. And again, this is something that's very unusual. Mice, rats form no bond whatsoever. 
Now, why is monogamy adaptive? Not all rodents are monogamous, right? Only a very few. Well, um, there's a couple of different scenarios in which monogamy is adaptive, and one is if it takes two to raise a family, then maybe it's adaptive for those two to work as a partnership. So, for example, maybe in our evolutionary history, it was good to have both the male and the female, the mother and the father, to bring resources because the, the offspring had such a long developmental time period, maybe. Uh, other cases, for example, if there are predators in the environment, because imagine if you're a vole and you live in an environment and there are weasels in the environment. And let's say that your brain is organized in such a way that you want to mate with as many females as possible. You don't bond with any of those females. You may have 10 babies, 10 litters in one month. That sounds like you're very successful. But if there are predators in the environment and every one of the moms of your babies has to go get food every day and leave the babies unattended, you're going to produce zero babies that are survive. So under that condition, it's better to find one and have fewer babies, but take care of those babies. Okay? Uh, another situation where monogamy evolves is uh, in the case of when it's difficult to find a partner who is not already pregnant. Right? Um, or difficult to find a partner, period, so under low population density. A great example of that is these deep sea anglerfish. These guys live deep in the dark, vast open ocean and not much light. They have this bioluminescent antenna and they kind of communicate with this light on this antenna and try to find each other. And if a male is lucky enough to find a female, he may spend half of his life just trying to find a female. When he finds one, he bonds with that female and these guys are monogamous. He's bonded to her, but in this case, it's not an emotional bond. Okay, this, this animal is bonded. He's bitten a hold to her and they fuse blood vessels and they share a circulation. And he begins to degenerate until there's nothing much left but his most important body parts. And that's his hypothalamus and his testicles. Okay, and you may say this guy lost a lot of independence and quality of life, but what he has gained is the ability that every time she's ready to spawn, he's right there ready to fertilize those eggs. And so the genes that gave him the brain, that made him engage in this behavior, is passed on to the next generation. Not the genes of the guy who says, to heck with that, I'm going to live my independent life. Right? So that's how natural selection shapes the behavior of an animal through changing the frequency of genes, which then help the brain wire itself and develop in such a way that that animal displays a certain kind of behavior. So is this love? No. Okay, so um, just because an animal engages in a behavior that is reminiscent to something that we can think of as humans doesn't mean that it's the same. Okay. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, I thought it was very interesting. If, if there's 5% of mammals are monogamous, but they're not all closely related, they're not cousins, right? That means monogamy evolves many times independently. How do you re re rewire the brain in such a way that you create this whole new behavior independently? And I think that evolution <clears throat> takes the easy way out. It takes circuits that are already present and tweaks them just a little bit. You don't have to rewire the whole brain. You just tweak something that's already there. And I believe that this hard-grained, very strong instinct that you find across every mammalian species that drives the mom to want to take care of the baby is simply tweaked a little bit to create a bond between these adults as well. And you have few changes in the brain that require that to be happening. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to make one point um, that I think is very important if you're not familiar with how behaviors are regulated in the brain of animals. Um, that, and that is that animals' behavior is regulated very tightly by hormones that are secreted by the body that are listening to what's happening in the body. And I just want to use this one example because it's a classic example of the estrocycle cycle where um, a female produces an ovary and that, that is associated with changes in estrogen and progesterone. And that's what prepares the uterus. These steroid hormones are, list, are secreted by the ovary to prepare the uterus. And it, they just happen to be secreted at the time that the egg is popped out. And that is the precise moment that that animal can become pregnant. And if you're a rat or a cat or most other animals, this is the only time when the female is interested in sex. So this changes in estrogen, progesterone goes into the brain, binds to receptors in the brain, and then changes the whole perception of the, the, the you know, the 
cognitive processes of that animal and that female wants to have sex at that time. So hormones play an important role. The same thing happens with maternal behavior. If you've ever known someone who's pregnant, they go, they go through pregnancy and then towards the end of pregnancy, they start having sometimes what we call a nesting kind of behavior, you know, getting cleaning and whatever. And, well, animals do this too. And it again is, has to do with hormones, molecules that are produced by the ovary. So the ovary produces estrogen, progesterone while she's pregnant, if this is a rat. And those hormones are not only going to make the uterus ready or to make the mammary glands ready, they're going into the brain. The brain is listening to what happens. And then when all the right hormones are kicked off and released, the estrogen goes up, progesterone goes up, progesterone goes down, oxytocin is released, prolactin is released. It activates these circuits that are within the brain in such a way that now that animal becomes maternal. It wants to take care of babies. The same molecules like oxytocin, which I'm going to talk a lot about, that's the molecule that causes the uterus to contract in the first place. It's what doctors use to induce labor. It's also what's released from the pituitary into the blood that acts on the breast to cause the milk ejection. When the baby suckles the breast, it goes, causes the milk ejection. That molecule also goes into the brain and causes that mother to now want to take care of babies. And how do we know this? We knew this from experiments where, that were done in the late 1970s. So oxytocin is a pep molecule that doesn't get into the brain uh, very easily if you inject it peripherally. So you have to inject it directly into the brain. And what was known at that time is that if you take a virgin female rat who's never had babies, you put the babies in the cage, what does she do to those babies? Huh? She kills them. They stink and they squeal. They're very much like a baby that's on the airplane when you're flying across the country. It's very annoying. She finds these pups annoying. At least she kills, she will try to kill them. Um, but if she has gone through the hormones of pregnancy that I showed you before, that same female is transformed and then she will learn to press a lever to get pups to delivered down a chute. Piles and piles of pups. So the same stimulus that was once very annoying and aversive has now become irresistible simply because of the changes of the hormones that are happening in her brain. Okay? So we talk about, you know, cortex and all this stuff being involved in these complex cortical processes, but there's a lot of stuff going on down deep under that that's changing the mood, changing other aspects, just changing drives. If you take a female rat that's virgin, show her pups, she'll attack the pups. If you inject oxytocin into her brain like happens when she gives birth, she will go retrieve those pups. Okay, so other studies were done in sheep where, so rats, they just love pups, right? They have a nest and any pup in that nest is probably theirs and she'll press a lever to get many pups to come out. Piles of pups, right? Sheep live in herds. There's a breeding season. Lots of females give birth at the same time. So she, a female sheep not only has to say, wow, lambs are adorable. She has to say, my lamb is adorable and butt away the other lambs. And that is also caused by oxytocin. If you infuse oxytocin into the brain of a female sheep and give her a baby that's not hers, she will, her brain will just assume that this is her baby. She will take care of that baby. She's bonded to that baby. Okay, and this is the history before I get into the vol work, but of maternal behavior, of the oxytocin's role in making a mother bond with the baby. Now I'm gonna talk about oxytocin and another molecule called vasopressin because I wanna make this point. Um, oxytocin and vasopressin, mammals have both. They have different names, but you will also find them in vertebrates and fish. You also find them in earthworms and even nematodes. This is an ancient molecule. Um, <clears throat> it's a molecule of bonding, but it's also found in where animals like uh, earthworms, where this molecule causes egg laying behavior. Just like birth in humans, egg laying behavior. Nematocin. Nematocin, nematodes are C. elegans. They have got like 300 neurons, right? I don't think they're sentient, by the way. But they have about 300 neurons, but they use this molecule in a very similar way to what animals do and we do, and that is um, sensory, um, social sensory integration. And so this is a paper that was published in Science by Corey Bartman's group where they deleted the earth, the nematodes oxytocin. And what they found was is that they had problems mating, specifically in detecting one another, the exact spot where they're supposed to oppose their genitals in order to be able to mate. 
So even way far back, it was involved in getting individuals together and social relationships. Now I'm going to get back to the voles and talk about how do we study this bonding behavior in voles. <clears throat> we have this test. This is called the partner preference test. <clears throat> it has two parts. It has a beginning part where we have animals cohabitate, where they hang out together. Either this, during this time they can mate or we don't let them mate. We can change how long they're together. We can do various drug manipulations during this time. <clears throat> And then we give them this choice test. Here I'm pretending like we're testing the female. We take the male. He has a little collar around his neck so that he is uh, tethered into this apartment here. He can move around here, but he can't get out. We take a novel male, put him on this side. He's tethered here so he can move around here, can't get out. And then we just see who does she spend her time with for the next three hours. Okay, a very standardized test. This is, what, this is what it looks like in real video. This is a male. He spent last night with this female. He's never seen this female. In most animals, which female do you think the male will choose? The new female or the female that he was with the night before? The new female. Furry voles are different in this way. He's mated and there's been a transformation in his brain. Interesting thing about these voles, maybe Alex told you about this, but uh, when they bond, not only do they have a preference for their partner, they actually have aggression towards the animals that are not their partners. So there was a little tussling going on there. And now you can see how he's going to go over and he's going to behave very differently towards his partner. And so you imagine if we have a large, say 12 of these cages set on the ground, we have computers above, it's all automated. So we can just watch and quantify how much time do they sit next to each other in this huddling posture. This is how we determine whether they bonded or not. And therefore we can use this test to identify what brain mechanisms are involved in this bonding process. And this is one of the first ones that was done where <clears throat> Sue Carter and Tom Ansel before, actually just before I started working with the voles, said, well, if oxytocin is involved in maternal bonding and in sheep you know, bonding, with, maybe it's involved in pair bonding. So what they did was this, they, they injected into the brain directly either cerebral spinal fluid, which is the vehicle, or the oxytocin, and then they put them together but did not allow them to mate. They found that if they were together for six hours, with no mating, just this molecule was sufficient to cause more than 90% of them to have a pair bond. So they can induce a bond with a single molecule. It doesn't mean that only a single molecule is involved in the bonding, but it does mean <clears throat> that a mo single molecule plays an important role. They also found if you take the animals and you inject oxytocin antagonist blocker into the brain, and this time you let them mate, <clears throat> That if you block the oxytocin receptors, <coughs> they will not form a bond. The animals that got the control fluid will form a bond. So oxytocin signaling is, signaling is necessary for pair bond formation in these guys. Now, I got really fascinated by this system when I realized that there are different kinds of voles. They look the same. One is not higher than the other in anything, but they're different, okay? <laughs> Prairie voles are highly, very highly social. They crave social contact. They spend more than half of their time sitting next to another vole, so they're just very highly social. They're socially monogamous and biparental, but then you have the metal voles that are pretty much asocial. So their brain is just organized in a little bit different way so that to them, it doesn't really matter if they're around another vole or not. Sure, they like to have sex, they mate, they have babies, but the male splits to find another female, the mother, has her babies by herself, and after 10 days, she abandons the babies. It's fine, though, because those babies survive. They're adapted. That's the adaptive strategy. But So I thought, well, this is a cool system to try to figure out what's different in the brains between these two animals that basically, they look the same. I mean, these are very similar animals. They're very small brain rodents, and by the way, they're, they're about the size of a hamster. Um, but one is just very highly social, has a rich social repertoire, the other one does not. So what's different? And I thought, well, maybe prairie voles just have more oxytocin than meadow voles. So we take the brain, stain the brain to look and see where the oxytocin cells and fibers are, and we see absolutely no difference in where the oxytocin is. But oxytocin is a neuropeptide, a neuromodulator. It doesn't act unless it binds to a receptor. Right? So the cells that respond to oxytocin are those that have receptors. 
we can take the brain and say, where are the receptors in the brain? And when we do that, we see something that's quite remarkable. This is a prairie vole, metal vole. Very hard to tell these apart. If I were to put a prairie vole and metal vole in front of you, you'd, you'd probably have a hard time telling them apart. But the brain, it's easier to tell them apart by their brain neurochemistry. Prairie voles have high densities of oxytocin receptors in an area called the nucleus accumbens. This is the brain's reward pathway. This is where dopamine receptors are. This is an area that's involved in addiction. It's also involved in reward learning. You do something, it feels good. Wow, that felt good. You do it again. Okay? Metal voles don't have oxytocin receptors there. In my opinion, the, the voles of these two brains, sorry, the brains of these two voles are organized in the same way. The physical connections, the cortex, everything is organized the same way. But the brain is organized into different modules that do different things, different functions. And the different modules that do different functions are differentially sens sensitive to oxytocin. So we know that oxytocin is released when the animals mate, both males and in females. So when the animals mate, oxytocin is acting in the nu nucleus accumbens as well as the prefrontal cortex of the prairie vole. But in the metal vole, it's not. So therefore, there are different consequences of the mating in these two different species. And actually, we know quite a bit more about the details of that as well. And we know that the prefrontal cortex and nucleus accumbens is the place where oxytocin is acting to create the bonds, because if we go in with a very fine needle into the prefrontal cortex or into the nucleus accumbens and inject an oxytocin receptor blocker in these areas, these animals will not form a bond. If we inject the same drug into this area, the animals will mate and they will form a bond. So. This is how we begin to identify the neural circuitry that's involved in complex behaviors. Now, something very cool about this oxytocin system is that it, the distribution is very species specific. Somebody was talking about species uh, differences earlier. And, and I think that you're right. Uh, by studying mice, you're not going to be able to study this kind of behavior. And so but <clears throat> by studying voles, they're perfectly, you know, they're really a good, great model for this kind of behavior. So uh, you can learn something. But this is a marmoset, which is also monogamous, totally unrelated to voles. These are primates. If you look at where their oxytocin receptors are, they also have oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbens. If you look at rhesus macaques, very highly intelligent primates, but they don't form bonds. They have no oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbens. This is human. This is transcriptomic data from humans. This is the nucleus accumbens oxytocin receptor. You can see that the human nucleus accumbens is also loaded with oxytocin receptors. <clears throat> Mice is not. So the species that tend to form bonds seem to be the ones that have the oxytocin receptors in this particular area. And now I, I just want to make one point but I think, because I can't think it's kind of interesting about human sexuality is very different from other sexuality and other mammals. In, in nearly all other mammals, maybe exception of bonobos, but in most other animals, females usually mate only at the time that they're ovulating, at the time they can get pregnant. Mating has an obvious function, to get pregnant. Okay? Other times they don't mate. Humans can mate, the, the reproduction, the sexual drive has been somewhat disentangled from the ovary so that mating can happen at other times, even when you can't get pregnant. But also humans, so the two most potent stimuli of oxytocin release in, in a female is vaginal cervical stimulation, which happens during birth, but it also happens during sex. The other is uh, suckling, nipple stimulation that happens during nursing. And we are the only species on the planet where breast stimulation is also has become sexualized and part of sexuality. So I think that human sexuality has actually evolved to actually maximize the stimulation of this maternal bonding circuitry to help maintain and strengthen the bond over time. So human sexuality recapitulates the physiological stimuli of birth and nursing. So we've talked about oxytocin now in bonding between uh, pair bonds, but it turns out oxytocin is involved in more than just bonding. It's not just a bonding molecule. Well, it's, it's more than just romantic bonding, or I wouldn't say voles have romantic bonding, but pair bonding. Um, in dogs, there's been a series of studies now that looking at dogs and human relationships, dogs look, when dogs look into the eyes of the owners, it induces oxytocin release in the owners.
If you give oxytocin to a dog, they'll look into the owner more, into the owner's eyes more, and then the owner will have more oxytocin release, and then they will in turn look at the dog more, and the dog will have more oxytocin release. And this does not happen with wolves. So the ancestors of dogs do not look into the eyes of the owners, even if they are raised in exactly the same way, and they do not have that oxytocin signaling that oxytocin between the um, between the dog and the owner. So there's an interesting example of evolution of a behavior that allows for visual communication between humans and dogs and create intraspecies bonding that is pretty much absent in the ancestor. Um, but I think it's present in the infant wolf and in that domestication somehow created um, neoteny. But what is oxytocin? So if you Google oxytocin, you will find it's the love molecule, the cuddle hormone, the moral molecule. That's BS, by the way, but it's out there. Um, so I, what I want to do is break it down, <clears throat> and this is what I do in my own science, is to take complex things. We're talking about love, okay, break it down into pair bonding. But now break it down even further into what the molecules do and how you get a sort of a puzzle of molecules and circuits working together to create something as complex as love. Um, and I'll start by saying, what does oxytocin really do? And how we figured this out is by taking mice and we knocked out the oxytocin gene so the mice did not have oxytocin. Mice don't bond, so we didn't test them for bonding. But what we did find is that the mice could not tell each other apart. M mice normally, when they meet each other, if you do this test where you uh, let them meet each other over and over and over again, uh, the first time they, it's like two dogs when they meet. They sniff each other, right? And you quantify how long they sniff each other. Ten minutes later, they let them meet again. Ten minutes later, later you let them meet again. Ten minutes later, you let them meet again. And they habituate. They go down in the amount of time that they investigate. Whereas the oxytocin knockout mice never habituate. It's as if it was the same, a different individual each time. Now, how do mice tell each other apart? They all look the same, right? They all smell different. They, they can all, they can, they have the same sm smelling molecules, but different ratios. So it's a very complicated thing. It's, it's very uh, similar to the task that we do when we look at lots of people. We can remember thousands of people, but you're all the same. You all have two eyes here, you all have a nose here, you all have a mouth here, but my brain is very specialized in the seeing what is, makes each one of you independent. Uh, this story always reminds me of penguins where the, you know, if you ever watched the, what was that movie called? The Walk of the Penguins, The March of the Penguins, right? The penguins, they pair bond. Right, and um, one of them will keep the egg on their feet, and the other one goes off and gets food for several days, and then comes back and jumps up, and just before them is 25,000 penguins, and they have to go find their penguin, and they all look the same, but their brain is very specialized in seeing which one is individual, and that's what oxytocin is doing. Oxytocin is making the brain pay attention to the very fine details that make individuals unique. It's actually what I call it is this, the, the salience of the social stimuli. We talked about that as well. It's not that they can't smell or they can't remember. If you take another mouse and you scent them with a perfume like lemon scent or almond scent, then they can remember. So it's not that they're stupid. It's just that they can't use the social cues to remember. So it's equivalent to you going to a conference and seeing someone and you maybe like something tells you you've met this person before, you don't know, but you look at the tag and then, oh, that's Sally. She graduated from so-and-so and I know everything about her, but you didn't recognize her by her face. Okay, I think that's what oxytocin is doing. So it's, it's in the perception of social stimuli. And, um, you know, these are the kind of details that you will never learn from a brain or organoid. And you may not even think that this is important, but it's one part of a detail that adds up when you build the whole story, you understand a great deal. How does it work in the olfactory bulb? Oxytocin is released in the anterior olfactory nucleus, which is a cortical structure that sends these uh, um, glutamatergic neurons to these granule cells. These granule cells are inhibitory. So what they do is actually, so in the, in the olfactory bulb in an animal that's by himself, there's a lot of noise. It's like static on a television show, if you remember static, okay? 
And then imagine oxytocin comes along, it turns up the gain of these negative cells, and all that static goes away. And what comes through? The signal. Signal. Okay? This is relevant to the disorder like autism. Sorry about that. This is what oxytocin does, is help quieten the noise, allow the signals to come through so that social information can get to where it needs to go. Um, this is in the wrong place, I'm gonna skip. Let's see, hold on one second. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip this, get back to where I'm supposed to be. Okay, so um, everything that I've told you so far is true for oxytocin, it is, it is true for males and females. So we used to have this misconception that oxytocin was only a female because obviously mothers give birth and they lactate, but that's not the case. We now know that oxytocin is working in both males and females acting in the same way to cre help create this bond. But males have in something in addition to this sort of warm, nurturing bond that females have, but males have something that's regulated by another molecule called vasopressin. Vasopressin in other animals is involved in territorial behavior, aggression. This is my territories. This was discovered in hamsters. If you take a hamster, which is a scent-marking animal, they have scent glands, they, um, they have territories. If you put some vasopressin into their brain, they will start scent-marking everything in their cage. So it's amazing how you can control these animals' behaviors through chemistry, okay? Well, and vasopressin is sexually dimorphic, so you can actually tell the difference between a male and a female brain by standing for vasopressin. The males have more vasopressin than do females, and that's because it's regulated by testosterone. If you castrate a male, his testosterone goes, his vasopressin goes away. But vasopressin is also involved in pair bonding in males. And it's involved in that territorial aspect of it. So there are six differences in the nature of the pair bond in these voles in the sense that the, um, the nurturing bond with a partner evolved from the adaptation of systems that are ever present in other species for the mother-infant bond. But on top of that, males also have this vasopressinergic, this vigilance, this territorial behavior so that the female actually becomes a part of his territory. And so not only is he always like daunting on the female, doting on the female, but he's also very aggressive to protect that female because it's important that she does not get mated. But I'm gonna stop talking about vasopressin now to try to keep it on focus here. So the chemistry of the pair bond, it's not a single molecule. Each molecule does different things. They work together. But this is my model of what I think happens during a pair bond. Oxytocin is involved in the perception of social stimuli. So it turns up the gain, turns down the static, lets the signal to noise come through so that all of the social cues can get processed by the brain. Also with mating and pair bonding, you have dopamine. Dopamine is what is, uh, um, is rewarding, right? Rewarding and reinforcing. It's, the mech it's what's released with, by cocaine addiction. Opiates is the system that's affected by heroin. So there's very much a common system with the drug addiction system here. These three things work together. We know that if you block the dopamine receptors, the animal will mate, but they will not form a bond. If you block the opiate receptors, the animals will mate, they will not form a bond. So it's not a one chemical process. It's a chemical reaction that's happening in the context of a very specific circuit. And I'm, I'm going to show you this is what I think is happening during the bond. Let's imagine that this is a rat brain. He's mating for the first time, a male rat brain. He's never mated with a female. A female who is in estrus is placed in the cage with him and his brain starts lighting up. He's intrigued. He knows he should do something. He doesn't quite know what to do, but eventually he figures that out and he mates and the VTA neurons, which make dopamine, release that dopamine into the prefrontal cortex and to the nucleus accumbens and the ventral pallidum, and that activates this reward system and that male rat says, wow. It doesn't really say wow, but you know, if, if you put it in a brain scanner, Greg Burns could show you that his nucleus accumbens was lighting up. But actually, this is what makes sex rewarding, and we know even for rats, sex is rewarding because a male rat will press a lever many times to get a female rat to drop out of the ceiling. A female rat will also drop, 
press a lever many times to get a male rat to drop out of the ceiling if she can control the mating process. Sex is rewarding. But for a male rat, his, after he experiences this, then he tries to recreate this biochemical and circuit activation for the rest of his life by searching for females to mate with. Uh, his brain knows that this was a female and he tries to find other females. Whereas prairie voles, it's a little bit different in the sense that they're also mating. They're taking it in the odor of the partner, which is how they tell each other apart. And because they have not only dopamine receptors in the nucleus accumbens, but also the oxytocin receptors, which are involved in this individual discrimination, their brain is now associating not only this female with the sex, but this individual female with the sex or this male with the sex. So I, I think that, in essence, a pair bond, which sounds like a complicated process, is nothing more um, than neuroplasticity that makes the neural encoding of the partner's cues a kind of neural engram uh, be linked into the reward system of the animal. So we know that in the hippocampus and other brain areas, there are sets of cells that respond to each individual that the animal meets. So a pattern of cells. This animal, his brain now has a pattern of cells, an engram that represents this individual. Another individual does not represent, is, has a different pattern. They go back to the same partner again, you get the original pattern. This gets hardwired synaptic plasticity into the nucleus accumbens so that from then on that individual is inherently rewarding. Oxytocin facilitates this happening and once it happens, you don't need oxytocin continuously. It's just the formation of a memory. Now I want to go back to my misplaced slides because I think this is a really good illustration of that. This is a rat, non-monogamous. They don't bond. They just mate. <clears throat> the male brain perceives this female as a female in estrus, and they mated. It's different from this male. It's female's good, male's bad and um, he searches for females, whereas prairie voles, when they mate, they have a higher, um, higher information content in the social stimuli that's coming in. It's not just a female in estrus. This is Sally. And then Sally becomes linked into the reward system through this engram system. Now, how does it work? I just want to show you some kinds of experiments that we do to try to figure this stuff out. We decided, what if we take an animal and we block all the oxytocin receptors in its brain and we allow it to mate, and then we look at what brain air, what, what cells are activated? How is the brain activated during mating process? And we can do that by uh, taking the brains after the mating and staining for something like FOSS. It's just like fMRI, pretty much, except you need to take the brain out. And what we found is, I'll just show you the um, short results, and that is, if we looked at parts of the brain that are involved in processing social information, from the olfactory bulb to the amygdala, to the prefrontal cortex, to the nucleus accumbens, and an animal that's sitting in a cage by itself, and we do a correlation between activity of all these different areas, there's not very much correlation in brain areas, in the activ activation of brain areas. However, if we let an animal mate, um, and we have oxytocin flowing, so we don't give oxytocin receptor antagonist. Boom, all of the areas become lockstep with each other in terms of activation. So there's functional connectivity. Information is flowing from the olfactory bulb deep into the brain to the reward system. You block oxytocin receptors in the brain, it doesn't go there, right? So oxytocin is involved in helping the flow of social information through the brain making sure that it gets to places like the hippocampus so you can make an engram, so you can remember somebody, like to the nucleus accumbens so that it can be linked into the reward system so somebody can become rewarding to you. They can become your partner. A um, little bit different experiment here. We can look at how early life nurturing experience can affect our later life behavior. This is important for psychiatry. I'm in a department of psychiatry, by the way. And... Um, so I have to do things that are related to mental health in some way. My student was interested in what happens to these little pups if they experience something like neglect. So she did an experiment where she took these little pups, and this is uh, nothing near as harsh as what many 
human baby's experience, but she put them in little isolation chambers for three hours per day in a warm incubator. So it was the right temperature of a nest, but they just weren't in social contact. They weren't getting social touch from their mom, right? Three hours per day for the first two weeks of life. And then after two weeks, so at three weeks they wean, and then they go off into a cage by them with, the, they, with their three siblings together. But so this was before weaning. And then when they grew up and became 90 days of age adults, they tested them on whether they could, they could form a pair bond. And they found that um, actually this early life neglect impaired their ability to form a bond later in life. But when my student looked at the data, she, she could see that there was a lot of individual variation there. Some individuals could form bonds just fine and other ones could not. And she wanted to know where did that individual variation come from and it turns out that in prairie voles, even though they're all the same species, there's some individuals that have high densities of oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbens, and others that have low receptor densities in the nucleus accumbens. You can see in other areas, like the amygdala, the expression of the receptor is exactly the same between different individuals. So some individuals have high and some individuals have low, just like some of you will have high and some of you will have low receptor densities for various things. And so this huge amount of individual variation is what predicts whether the animals will be able to form a bond or not. So animals that have naturally high receptor densities are the ones that are, if they get experienced early life neglect, they're resilient. They're fine as adults. However, the animals that are born with these low levels of receptor densities, when they become adults, they're susceptible. Maybe this is adaptive. Maybe in nature, it's a good idea if you have neglect early in life to be promiscuous and not to bear bond later in life, right? But the fact is, is that there's something that's different in the brains when these guys are born. Sorry. Something that's different in the brains of these guys when they are born so that their early life experience, their environment shapes their social behavior very different. And it turns out, well, and, and so what I think is happening here is that when the pups are coming back home after this three hours per day, in the social isolation, and the mom and dad licks and grooms them, that social touch, licking and grooming, social touch, is activating the oxytocin system. We can see that in our staining. And that these guys that have lots of oxytocin receptors, when they get licked and groomed by their mom, it has a big effect on strengthening the neural connections that will help them form bonds later in life. These guys get licked and groomed just the same amount, but they don't have as many receptors, so it doesn't have that same effect on rewiring the brain. But anyway, the important thing is, is that maternal parental attention that they get early in life somehow shapes, has a long-term shaping of the brain to determine how they will uh, be able to bond later in life. And uh, just to give you an example of how um, this may also be happening in humans. This is a study done in Israel where they took fathers of six-month-old children, brought them into the laboratory, and this time they gave the fathers intranasal oxytocin or placebo. There's some debate about whether intranasal oxytocin actually gets into the brain or does much, but I'm not going to talk about that here. But given intranasal oxytocin and told them to play with their child, and the fathers that got intranasal oxytocin engaged more with the child, got more reciprocal eye-to-eye -eye contact and things like that with the child uh, than the father who got placebo. But the incredible thing was that they measured oxytocin in the saliva of the fathers. If the father sniffed oxytocin, of course, he's going to have a lot of oxytocin in his saliva. If he sniffed placebo, he's not, even if he played with his child. The incredible thing was is that the uh, infants whose fathers got oxytocin also had high levels of oxytocin in their saliva. The infants whose father got placebo did not. So if this study is true, then that suggests that engagement of the parent with the child has a lot of um, effect on this oxytocin system, which can influence the behavior uh, of the child when it grows up. And uh, we published this paper on, it's a review paper in science on biology of parenting, which is, uh, I suggest that you read if you're interested. It's, it has both human and animal research and, it, and basically, by becoming a parent, you have high levels of oxytocin, which activates this reward system that makes baby stimuli be very attractive, but it makes crying and poop not be so, uh, not be so annoying and um, increases empathetic response, helps you engage with the child. And then oxytocin is released in the child, and that has an effect on the brain, but it, 
it depends on how much receptors are there, on how, what kind of effect that it can have. And I haven't told you why those receptors are different. Those two individuals had different levels of receptors, not because they had different experiences, but, they, um, but because they inherited a single nucleotide polymorphism, a, a DNA element, that, one variation in, a, in, a, in the DNA that is not in the coding region of the gene, but in the regulatory element of the gene that causes variation in expression. So by using these animals, we can sort of begin to identify how does variation in genes lead to brain variation in chemistry, and then how does that lead to variation in susceptibility to psychiatric disorders. So that was all about pair bonding. I'm going to talk about a couple of different behaviors that we've studied in voles to, to, to suggest that they have um, other interesting capacities that look similar to what humans do. Not a, they're not the same as what humans have, but if pair bonding is kind of like love. Uh, this consoling behavior maybe is like empathy in voles. So we thought that these guys, this was uh, in collaborations with Franz de Waal, who studies all chimpanzee stuff. We thought, hey, these guys are monogamous. They live in a nest that's got a male and a female. The female is generally always pregnant. So if the female is always is ever gets stressed out, it's to, to, to the male's advantage to reduce our stress so that the babies don't get um, high stress hormones. And so they should have evolved a ability to console one another. They have, uh, other siblings live in the nest as well, so it's a community. So we think they should have this kind of consoling behavior. And so we devised this test. Actually, it was my grad student who did this. Took these voles and uh, did something that sounds worse than it really is, but we took the partner and either took them and put them in a little cage for 20 minutes so they were just away from the partner, got a little time away, or we put them in a little, uh, in another cage where they would get light static electricity, a foot shock, and beep, 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 beep. So it was kind of a stress for days. It's like walking on the street out here in lots of you know, traffic. Um, and then we looked at what, what the animals did when they came back. So what did the partner do if, if the partner was stressed or was not stressed? And so on this side, you have the male, the female that's being dropped in, she was just taking a break. This female, she was one that was more stressed, had the, the tone and the light shock. And you can see he's already done, he's, um, met with her and then he's going off. And this one is very persistent, persistently grooming her. And we call this consoling because of a number of reasons. This reduces her anxiety. If we test her on elevated plus mates afterwards, if he is able to do this, her stress levels are down. Her hormone levels are down. Actually, his stress levels, this is empathetic-like response because if we have a, a barrier so he can see her when she comes back but he can't be with her, his hormone levels match her hormone levels. They're highly correlated. Okay, he increases grooming of her but not grooming of himself. So it's, there's self other distinctions. And, you know, for those people who are interested in empathy, you'll know there's lots of definitions involved. And we went through and was able to show that these voles um, showed many of the aspects of, of, of empathy. So this is a quantification of that data. They do it to their mate, not only to their mate, but they do it to their sibling. They do not do it to a stranger. So this is not just a response to a pheromone. You might think that, oh, there's... They're just secreting a pheromone, so they're going, it has to be somebody they know. It doesn't have to be related. It can be someone that you put into the cage with them in the first week of life. So they, it's, there's a familiarity bias. They only do it to animals they know. Um, males, females do it. Metal voles could give a crap if their partner was stressed. Okay? So here's the difference in behavior. It's not that one, so one, I'm suggesting that one of these voles, the curry voles, is expressing an empathy-like behavior. The other one is my mouth. Sorry, 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 sorry. I have to I usually wear one right here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one is showing this behavior. The other one is not. And it's not due to huge variations in cortical development or anything like that. It is about neurochemistry. And we know it's about neurochemistry because if we block oxytocin receptors, even the prairie voles, if the female comes back and she's been distressed, 
He doesn't care. So oxytocin somehow flowing has to be able, it allows him to detect the distress in the partner or the motivation to protect it. Uh, sorry, to um, the motivation to reduce that stress. And so why is oxytocin involved in this? Let's go back to what is oxytocin originally involved in? Maternal behavior. What, what do you think happens in a mother when a pup is across the way screaming? in distress. That mother goes there and that's empathy. So all mammals show this kind of empathy. It's just that we don't normally call it that because we say it's maternal behavior. It's an instinct. Well, you can have instincts, behaviors like empathy. It still may be instinctive, uh, you know, but it is um, regulated by the same kind of molecules. And I think that, you know, many kinds of pro-social behaviors have evolved originally from the very basic foundational mechanisms that are involved in maternal bonding. And that maternal bonding gets, goes and allows you to have pair bonding and then it allows you to have this kind of empathy to people that you know. And then maybe in humans it's expanded to whoever is in your in-group, however you define your in-group or somehow. And there is evidence that oxytocin is involved in human empathy as well. And maybe Jennifer is going to say something about that. But here again, in the, with the voles, we're able to like, you know, to definitively show where oxytocin is acting to create this empathy. And um, if we block oxytocin receptors in the anterior cingulate cortex, the animals do, do not respond to their partner being, in, being distressed. If we block it in the prefrontal cortex, they do respond. What's incredible about this is that the anterior cingulate cortex in humans is also involved in empathy. You talked about a little bit in the dolphins, right? Uh, this is a cognitive area, and, the, and what you see here is a conservation in function and in a molecule in voles all the way up to humans. I'm gonna quickly go over this because we don't have much time, but Another thing that we can study in the voles is what happens, you know, in the brain when they lose their partner. Because as I mentioned, you know, the story that I told you about the stork, it was incredible. I didn't believe the, my tour guide told me. I didn't believe it. I went online and looked at it. For 16 years, this male stork has been coming back to his injured female, finding the same house 13,000 kilometers away. Um, so this bond is really important. And we know in people that if they lose their bond, it increases mortality. In, it um, increases cardiovascular disease, lots of things. So we wanted to see if we could study something about the consequences of losing a bond in voles. And um, basically what we did was we took animals and either paired them with their sibling or paired them with a, a male with a female. So these guys could pair bond. These guys just hung out with their brother. And then we either, then we separated them from their brother or from their, separated them from their brother or from their, um, partner. And then we tested them on tests that give you readout that's relevant to depression, like grieving. Okay. And um, this is a measure of depression higher up. And what you can see in these two different tests is that when the animals lost their partner, they showed very high levels of a depression relative to when they lost their sibling. What that means is that something happens when they specifically form a bond so that then when they are away from that bonded partner, it causes depression. It's very much like uh, also like uh, addiction. When someone is addicted to something and then they go without their drug, it creates a negative affect and brings them back together. And I think that this is actually a very important model, uh, a very important mechanism that maintains a bond. Right, so pair bonds change over time. In the beginning, there's a lot of that dopamine, oxytocin, exhilaration. It's like taking cocaine. You know, you can't stop thinking about your partner. But then later on, things change. I remember when I first got married 14 years ago to my wife. We had a dog. Me and my, when I would come home from work, my wife and my dog would both be equally excited to see me when I get home. Now my dog is still very excited to see me when I get home. <laughs> Yet me and my wife are still together. And why is that? <clears throat> So it turns out if you take these animals that show this depression when they lose their partner and you inject into their brain, into their nucleus accumbens, specifically oxytocin, it's okay. 
So what's happening is that when they lose their partner, there's a withdrawal of oxytocin that creates a negative affect. And the natural response in nature is to try to go back and find your partner to maintain the bond. So I think that, um, I'm gonna skip this here. That pair bonding, there's a yin and yang of the pair bond. There's a part that I talked about early and that we did research on a number of years ago that shows that oxytocin acting with dopamine, with the mating and all that stuff is helping tie that engram into the nucleus accumbens, into the reward system so the partner is rewarding. But there's also the negative effect of being without oxytocin when you lose the partner. And um, I've done more research on this, more details. I just don't have time to show you this. Um, anyway, I have a lab in Japan now. This is my logo for my Japanese lab. Now I'm just gonna end up um, with some slides about humans. First of all, there's a couple of studies showing that um, in humans, variation in the vasopressin receptor and the oxytocin receptor, the same genes that we show that predict variation, variability in pair bonding behavior in voles also affect pair bonding behavior in humans. So the same genes seem to be involved. And um, so oftentimes I get media um, request, you know, ask, you know, like, especially with the, with this empathy and consoling behavior, people are like, they say, wow, these voles, they must be like people that they, they also think they're like this big. They're like, they think they're like beavers, right? They're little, they're little guys this big. And they're like, wow, they're like people. They form bonds and they show empathy and whatnot. And the point that I try to make it across is not that they're like people, but that we should consider ourselves as part of a continuum. And that these animals, have some of the basic fundamental underlying neural mechanisms that cause them to engage in the same kind of behavior or similar behavior to what we do. They don't experience the bond in the same way that we experience love. But I do believe that our love is built upon these mechanisms that allow them to create a bond. They don't have the capacity to show empathy in the same way that we do. But these neural mechanisms that they have that allows them to show these behaviors that we observe, I think are the neural basis of what humans show. Okay, so, um, all right, I'll stop. Can I just make one more point? Just one, one slide, okay, because I think people will like this. Uh, so this is my wife today, and this is a study that was done giving humans intranasal oxytocin, men intranasal oxytocin, and they asked the men to look at pictures of either their partner or other women who was not their partner and to rank them from one to 10. And they gave them intranasal oxytocin or placebo. And what they found is that men, when they saw their partner after they got oxytocin, they rated them as being more attractive than when they did not get oxytocin when they got placebo. It did not make other women more attractive, only the partners more attractive. The cool thing is that they did this in a brain scanner to see what parts of the brain were activated by oxytocin when they looked at their partner and they found these two little spots here were activated. And these are the same two spots that I've been talking about in voles where oxytocin is involved in pair bonding. So I think it's a pretty good case that, you know, by studying animals, we can learn something about this. And I'm not going to talk about how this relates to empathy, uh, to, sorry, to autism, but um, that was my next few slides, is that if, if oxytocin clarifies the social brain, increases the signal to noise, makes social stimuli more salient, then you should be able to use this um, to improve social cognition in autism and in schizophrenia and other disorders. All right. Okay, Jennifer, I think the way we'll do it is, wait, stay there. Let, let's let uh, people ask questions for about five minutes and then, and then I'll, and let me start with a remark. I now know what ruined my romantic life. It was vasopressin, yes. toxic um, jealousy, stuff like that. Uh, I should have had a vasopressinotomy, yes. yes. Okay. Jennifer? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, but people. Yes. Uh, start with Simon. Hi. I, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I'm just wondering about the role of, the social role of uh, oxytocin in their homologs in species that don't have maternal behavior. So there's like roles of, you know, in social approach in fish and that kind of thing. So- Wait, hold on back. Um, voles that don't show maternal behavior? Oh, sorry, uh, in animals that don't have maternal behavior. So for example, you know, fish that don't have maternal behavior, but there's still a role for um, 
uh, oxytocin homologs in social approach and social behavior. So, yes. where, so if you kind of push back, would you see the maternal behavior building on something else? Or how, how do you see uh, that, that coming? Where do you see that? Yeah, so from? I see maternal behavior. Okay, so even so fish and reptiles and basically all vertebrates, um, they have uterus contractions that either get eggs out or get babies out. And that's birth, giving birth. And the oxytocin and vasopressin are involved in those uterus contractions. So I think that's what it's built upon. And then, so let's take birds. Birds is an interesting example because whereas 95% of mammals don't form bonds at all, they just, they, the mothers take care of their babies, 90% of birds do. So it's very common for birds to form bonds. And oxytocin, the bird's version of oxytocin in birds has been found to be involved in flock size, you know, what's, how, you know, the size of the group they want to be involved in, and also pair bonding. And, and also, you know, birds have maternal behavior. They also have lots of paternal behavior. So, um, yeah, but even it goes back beyond that to the earthworms that are where it's involved in the egg laying behavior. So I think it's, it's just like in the first slides I showed you about the estrogen and progesterone and how they're involved in like uterus, preparing the uterus for birth and, and all of that. All of these signaling molecules evolved way long time ago for peripheral physiological processes like giving birth or ovulation or preparing the uterus. And their actions in the brain really depend on what the animal needs to do during that time. So. Yeah, that, that flocking example, I mean, so there you would say the flocking is building on the, like what, which kind of work, that kind of works for the birds, but doesn't really work for the, for the fish, right? Um, where, where there's similar effects on grouping behavior mm -hmm. and social approach, but, um, but they don't have that, you know, well, I guess it's built, so there's a couple of things that I know that it's built on in, um, in invertebrates. So it, I think it's all about social. So even in the nematode, it was about perceiving the social stimuli of another animal, okay, with the mating. But if you go to um, leeches, so there's a great story about a cone snail who has in its venom a substance that when it's injected into the prey, the animal starts doing the motor pattern that it normally does when it's having sex, even if there's nobody to have sex with. It's kind of called, it's called corkscrewing. And um, the molecule in there that causes that is conopressin, or cono, it's the oxytocin of the, con, of the cone snail, which is the same as the oxytocin of the leech. So again, there is sexual behavior, so two animals coming together. Okay, yeah. So I think, you know, the common theme that I see across all of it is detection of cue, cues of a conspecific and then doing something with that, using that, detection, using that information to either make you, maybe if it's interacting with the dopamine system, to make you want to be in larger groups, you know, in terms of flocking and fish, it's not really well, we don't really know what all oxytocin does in fish. Okay, one more question from here, and then we'll go. There are just two things that I didn't quite understand. The first thing is when you showed the video of the male attacking the stranger females in prairie voles, uh, why did he take the time to attack this female? Is the female any threat to him or anything? Yes, he will attack any... Uh, well, so you see, it was not like a killing attack, right? So it was just a tussle. You're not... Um, and so, yeah, this is an interesting story that's been worked out as well by... Uh, Maybe Steve, maybe Steve won't talk about it, but um, <clears throat> after mating, there's a change in the dopamine receptors in the brain so that the D1 receptor goes higher than the D2. And because of that, that's what caused them to have the increased aggression as well as the vasopressin uh, causes them to have the increased aggression towards individuals that are not their partner, regardless of their, whether they're males or females. So it's a basically, this is an invasion in my territory. And... Um, that's just, I think that's the way it is. And he looks at me when he talks about vasopressin. Yes, now I And last thing, uh, it's just, what's the evolutionary advantage of mono monogamy? Is it just because of the low uh, population density? Yeah, well, that they so that's the most, comp for the vole story, voles, that's the, the best idea. And you, you can ask Steve Phelps when he comes too. But the idea is, so females don't ovulate. It, um, 
in mice and rats and most other rodents, every four days a female is in estrus. And so then she can get pregnant. But of course, most, most of the time they're just pregnant in the wild. So um, for, a fe for voles, it's different in the sense that a, a, a female has to smell the urine of a male for, four day, for three or four days. So a male has to pursue and court a female for three or four days, and then she comes in the estrus and then they mate. And uh, so if population density is low, the chances of him finding one like that and that he can sort of monopolize during that time and nobody else has already mated is low. So the idea is that it's best, better for him to just sit around home, wait for 21 days, and then she can get pregnant again. That's the idea. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Jennifer <coughs> Bartz is a professor of, are you in psychiatry? Psychology. Psychology at McGill, and she works on oxytocin in humans. Okay, yeah, so I'm uh, um, in the psychology department, and I'm a psychologist, an empirical psychologist, and uh, was asked to be the discussant for Larry Young today. I was really thrilled because Larry Young has really been a major um, inspiration in terms of my research. So I'm really interested in empathy, pro-social behavior, and attachment and bonding, and then became, as a postdoc, really interested in the biological substrate of those processes. And Larry Young's work, Tom Insel's work, Sue Carter's work drew me to oxytocin. And, um, and so a lot of my research focuses on that. So what I decided to do for this discussion, which is going to try to be brief. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about the uh, consolation uh, behavior that we, we talked about. And um, so I'll I have a few questions about that and a few comments. And then I want to kind of walk you into some of the research looking at the role of oxytocin in human social behavior, in particular uh, human empathy and human pair bonding in general. So, um, so you know, as I'd mentioned, this is this is actually um, when this paper came out, I was very excited, and it's one of my all-time favorite papers because it brings together two of the topics that I'm most passionate about: empathy and oxytocin. And so. Um, just to kind of summarize, because I realized that I wasn't sure if you guys had read the paper or how much was going to, how much Larry Young was going to go into the paper. So I just want to summarize some of the main findings from that paper. So basically, what um, Young and colleagues showed was that prairie voles engage in more kind of allo grooming behavior when reunited with a stressed partner. So he described how the partner was taken out, was stressed when they're reunited. Um, you could think of it as maybe the actor watches the demonstrator and then engages in more kind of grooming consolation behavior. Um, so as Larry pointed out, they seem to kind of notice in contrast to the more uh, um, asocial montane bull that their partners are actually in distress. Secondly, they, as I'd mentioned, engage in actual behaviors to console that other, uh, their partner. Um, and interestingly, this was really selective to the particular situation. So they engaged in these consolation behaviors when their partner was in distress, but not when their partner was not in distress. So there was a control condition where the partner wasn't in distress. They brought the animals back, and you don't see this uptick in consolation behavior. Interestingly, um, it was also very selective to the individual. So they engaged in this grooming behavior um, towards their partner, but they didn't kind of engage in self-grooming. And this is really interesting. And I'll come back to this in a moment when we think about what empathy is. So it's the grooming behavior seems to be um, kind of altruistic or indicative of empathic concern because it's not they're not doing it to themselves to alleviate their own distress. Um, they also, as Larry mentioned, um, showed this matching or what we call emotion contagion. So there was a correlation between the amount of stress and cortisol that was released in the demonstrator, or the one who was stressed, and in the partner. So there was this kind of state evidence for the state matching going on. And finally, um, there was evidence of, of social buffering. So the idea is that being empathic towards others, being empathic towards others with whom we care about, whether it's a child or romantic relationship partner, even a friend, um, is adaptive because it helps buffer the anxiety that the other individual is feeling. And presumably, one might argue that it is through that that um, those relationships are strengthened. And um, so what's really nice about that study is it really kind of, as Larry mentioned, 
gets at all of the aspects of empathy that we think of, or almost all of the aspects of empathy that we think of, or building blocks of empathy that we think of when we think of human empathy. So um, when we think of human empathy, there's no kind of universally agreed upon definition, but it's generally acknowledged that there are three kind of main components of human empathy. Uh, the first is what's called cognitive empathy, which is this mentalizing ability to identify the emotions of other individuals, um, also known as perspective taking, the ability to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Theory of mind falls under that um, cluster. So that's obviously not what we were talking about. Uh, I don't believe what Larry Young and colleagues were studying that particular paper because they weren't looking at these kind of cognitive processes. So as I mentioned though, the second component of empathy is this affective experience sharing component, which was indicative of that particular study. So you had that state matching. And empathy theorists argue that in addition to kind of understanding what another person's thinking and feeling, what's really important for empathic behavior is sharing that affective experience. So by sharing that affective experience, you remember how you felt maybe when you were in a particular situation like that, and that kind of um, often aversive experience arouses you to engage in behaviors, consolation behaviors, to alleviate the other person's distress. And there we have kind of the third component of empathy, which is the behavioral component that we all think of, displaying kind of pro-social behavior towards the other person, helping them, giving them a hug, expressing concern, sympathy, etc. So I think Empathy theorists in general um, don't necessarily know the precise interrelationships between these aspects of empathy. But one of my um, favorite uh, kind of schematics for this was one that was put forward by Tanya Singer and her colleagues. And um, the reason why I mention this is I think it's really um, reflective of how empathy was conceptualized in, in Larry Young's paper. So the idea is that you have this kind of stimulus or a target who's in distress and that um, activates some state of emotion contagion where you begin to kind of share the experience that the other person's feeling. You might feel aroused and distressed. It also activates this um, emotion recognition or cognitive aspects of empathy. So, you know, the pr precise timing of these, I don't know, is necessarily well worked out. And also whether those two are directly related. But um, what Singer noticed or noted was that the one thing that's really important when we think about empathy and human empathy, but was also demonstrated even in the Vols, was this notion of self-other distinction. So you need to be able to share the experience of another individual, but at some point you need to be able to kind of separate that experience and recognize that it is not, um, the, the, the distress is not something that you're experiencing yourself, it's something that the other person's experiencing. And if you don't have that kind of self-other distinction, that's, or that ability to self-other distinguished is really gonna be important in terms of the kinds of pro-social behavior that you're gonna show. So if you can recognize that the other's pain is not really your pain, then you will have kind of the resources to engage in empathic concern. You will know uh, how to behave in that situation, what the other person needs. If you can't recognize, if you can't make that distinction between self and other, then what typically happens is you become overwhelmed by uh, the stress of this particular situation. And often we see people withdraw from the situation. So they become overwhelmed by their own personal distress and kind of disengage from that type of situation. So I, I think I wanted to highlight this because I think um, this really nicely maps on and I think also shows how through these animal models, we can really understand and we can map out something as complex as human empathy, at least to a certain extent. So I guess one of the big questions that I had, but I think maybe Larry Young answered this a bit in his talk, was you know, what might be the specific kind of pathway or mechanism by which oxytocin is modulating empathy both in bulls, and then what I want to return to in a moment is, is in humans. So um, I mentioned, it seems to me that um, what was displayed by the socially, uh, the, the social prairie bulls is that they seem to be more attentive, more aware that uh, their particular partner was in distress. You need attention in order to kind of detect something in the environment. Um, and then there was this emotion contagion state matching, which may or may not, three minutes, uh, may or may not um, uh, be playing a role. And then finally, we have the actual actual behavior. And so, you know, one question is, is, is the pathway, you know, is it modulating 
these processes, one of these processes, and then you see these downstream effects. Is it modulating um, uh, all of them kind of differentially, or is it kind of acting to produce this kind of suite of coordinated behaviors? So that would be, you know, a question. I think I think that was the sense that I got from Larry's talk that is more in influencing this kind of suite of behaviors and circuits that have evolved to be coordinated to produce a more global empathic response. So I'm gonna, I have what, two minutes, three minutes? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is skip all this and I'm happy to talk about um, research looking at the effects of oxytocin in humans, but um, I wanna turn, I wanna share one other finding that has less to do specifically with empathy and more to do with this idea about the role of oxytocin in human pair bonding and, and uh, human, close relationships because, um, you know, a, a, an important aspect of these animal models is that we're not only understanding something about the neurobiology of love and attachment in bulls, but that we're also understanding something about the neurobiology of love and attachment in humans. And research in humans has been, you know, very slow compared to the non-human animal research. Um, but there is some suggestion that uh, oxytocin is involved in human attachment bonding. And in the context of human studying this in humans, we have kind of three methodological approaches that we can use. As Larry mentioned, we could administer intranasal oxytocin. There's a bit of a debate about that. And this allows us to look at kind of the functional role or the causal effects. But we can also look at genes that are associated with the oxytocin system, that influence the oxytocin system. And this is, I was very happy, the very first thing that Larry mentioned in his talk was that what spurred him on to this research was to look at how these kind of changes in DNA shape the person to become the social creatures that we are. So this is the approach that we used here because it's really actually quite difficult to study the dynamics of close relationships when you bring two people into the lab and you're able to study them for an hour and then you maybe give one oxytocin, one, one not oxytocin. So we took this genetics approach in this particular study. So this was actually a study where we did administer intranasal oxytocin and we did find that it kind of induced this other orientation is what we call it, uh, a focus on others, um, identifying with being caring, kind, warm, gentle, understanding, emotional. And so we wanted to look at whether this actually played out in real relationship dynamics. So what we did in this study was we had um, close romantic relationship partners, uh, over 100 of them, and they um, reported on their behavior after every significant social interaction that they had for a 20-day period. And some of these behaviors were with their romantic partner, and we had the data from the romantic partners and from the the act, we'll call the actors. So you have the participant and the romantic partner. Um, and so we can both look at actor effects and we can look at partner effects and what we wanted to look at. And then we went back and we genotyped these people. So, and in particular, we were particularly interested in a gene called CD38, which has been shown to influence oxytocin secretion in, um, in mice and has also been linked to the oxytocin system in humans. So we genotyped these couples and then we looked at whether um, a particular polymorphism um, of that gene influenced their communal behavior um, or their, you know, their kind of pro-social communal behavior in the context of these relationships. And so we, in fact, did find that this particular gene had a number of effects. So we were able, as I mentioned, to look at kind of the actor effects, the effects of possessing that gene. And I'll just quickly go through that. So in fact, consistent with all, a lot of the non-human animal research, we find that those who have um, a particular allele of this CD38 gene were significantly more likely to endorse engaging in communal behaviors during those social interactions. So for example, um, I expressed affection with words or gestures, I smiled and laughed during the interaction, I complimented the other person. So they were much more likely over that 20 day period, and we had about five interactions per day, suggesting that um, this particular gene strongly influences communal behavior. It also influenced uh, less quarrelsome behavior. So they were less likely to be cold, quarrelsome, antagonistic towards their partners. And interestingly, um, it influenced how they saw it in people who possess the certain allele actually saw their partner as engaging more communally in the context of these interactions. So if you possess the particular allele, you were going to ascribe more communal traits to your partner's behavior. 
it decreased participants' negative affect, and it also was associated with lower levels of felt insecurity or higher levels of felt security. And not surprisingly, higher global levels of relationship adjustment. There were also a number of partner effects. Okay, so I'll leave it there, and if you want to know more about it, you can tell me. You can ask me. We have time for questions now, very little. So ask short questions, short questions. What? How much? 10? Come on. 15? 15? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Hi. Um, I'm trying to make sense of the whole thing. Do you think it's more about the principle of the board hospital? Is those tra trainable? Yeah. Is it educatable? So, so th there are ways of um, inducing oxytocin release. So it's it's conceivable. So, for example, like social touch. Like we know that touch elicits oxytocin. So there's um, really cool data that's going to be coming out soon. That's not from my group, where somebody can actually record into a mouse brain the oxytocin neurons and every time the oxytocin neurons fire. So by doing that kind of experiment, we can say, okay, what naturally causes oxytocin to be released? And you know, then once we know that, then maybe if you can train an animal to do that, then you could do that. But really the more important application is um, if you can induce, so train a person to do something or maybe in the context of another like a therapist or a parent to induce oxytocin release and then combine that with some kind of behavioral therapy, you can have some kind of positive effect. Um, but there's no way that you could ever know that just starting out with humans. You know, you need, you know, we need to try to understand, you know, what is it that causes oxytocin release? You know? I wonder what the implications of these findings in general are for uh, our understanding of psychopathy. Do you know a lot about that? I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to answer that question. And you can also, um, I'm happy to hear what you have to say. So a lot of people were really interested in, um, you know, given the non-human animal work about the application of, um, of, first of all, using whether the oxytocin system might be disrupted in disorders like autism and psychopathy. And then in turn, whether you might be able to develop treatments based on this. And um, What's really interesting, though, in the empathy literature is that um, it seems that whereas both autism and psychopathy seem to have impairments in empathy, I think many would agree that the, the source of the impairment is very different in the context of autism, where it's more about theory of mind, whereas in psychopathy, it's really that I mean, I'm kind of glossing over a lot of research, but it's that affect sharing component mm -hmm. that really seems to be impaired in, um, in, in psychopathy. So, you know, maybe the simple answer might be that um, it depends, well, I don't, it's simple, but it kind of depends on what we think oxytocin's doing. But if in fact it is coordinating kind of a suite of behaviors that involve both emo emotion recognition and affect sharing, then it might actually be adaptive for psychopathy. But it's really interesting because um, when you know some of these studies came out in the early 2000s, I was speaking with James Blair, who's an expert in psychopathy research, and there was a study that showed that oxytocin attenuated amygdala activity to fearful stimuli. And he said when that study, so there was a study that showed that oxytocin increased trust in humans, and I think he, he this is anecdotally, he said he was really excited when that came out about the potential application to psychopathy. But then when the study showing that re it reduced amygdala reactivity to fearful stimuli came out, he said he, He's, you know, he's like, this isn't going to work because with psychopathy, what you see is you don't see that kind of amygdala activation. So we don't need something that's going to attenuate that. I think our understanding of oxytocin, though, has, you know, expanded. And if, in fact, um, it does involve some aspect or augment some aspect of emotion sharing, I don't know if uh, if it's necessarily not useful. But I'd be yeah, two, curious. Two, two points just to add to that is, uh, you know, uh, one, I agree, you know, I think. The idea is that oxytocin acts on multiple systems. It's not just a autis autism drug. It acts on the systems that are in deficit in autism and maybe also in psych psychopathy. Um, 
However, there could be differences, and it could be, in fact, that uh, psychopathic individuals have less oxytocin receptors in certain areas, mm -hmm. and so therefore would not be effective. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that's why they have psychopathy. And also, this business about the amygdala, here's a perfect example where human research does not get you the information that you get from animal research. Mm -hmm. You know, we know from the amygdala in, in animals, it's made up of 26 different parts, right? And they all do, some of them are in, involved in vigilance and, you know, they do different mm -hmm. things. So we have a very sophisticated understanding of the amygdala in humans. But then to draw a con quick conclusion from an imaging study that looks at the entire amygdala, yeah. I think it's just, um, that's wrong. So I hope in the future people, Im human oh. imaging people will start to be a little bit more sophisticated. And it does seem there was a subsequent paper actually by Gamer and colleagues where they actually had a much more fine-grained resolution of yeah. the effects of, uh, of oxytocin in, in different parts of the brain that did show these kind of differential effects. Um, can I just add one yeah. more thing? Is that all right? Yep. So um, related, uh, not about psychopathy per se, but something following up on what Larry said about you know how these, these systems develop uh, through the, and they're influenced by early life experiences. Um, we were really interested when I was in psychiatry um, about the application of oxytocin and borderline personality disorder. Again, this was inspired by this, the, the trust study, borderline personality disorder being a disorder marked by kind of impaired trust and certainly um, highly volatile interpersonal relationships. So we actually uh, conducted a study where we administered oxytocin to people with borderline personality disorder and healthy people and measured cooperative behavior. And in that study, we actually found that oxytocin significantly decreased uh, trust and cooperative behavior in people with borderline personality disorder. So it's, it's really important to think about you know, how these systems have been shaped through development, what might be differences in the underlying neurobiology, and that it's not simply a fact of kind of bringing oxytocin, everybody up to the same level. Hi, um, I was wondering how um, how is the causality behind the behavior explained by its establishment of its neural correlates? How is the sorry uh, the uh, causality? I remember you you were talking. So, about so, so how is the causality of the explained by the neural correlates of the studied behavior? Uh, we we do not ever use neural correlates to call to establish causality. But what we do, if we can go, like some of the pharmacological studies, if we can block oxytocin receptor transmission in a brain area and then the behavior uh, is eliminated, we know that oxytocin uh, acting in that brain area is necessary. So that's not a, cor that's not a correlation. That is a causation. So um, another example I didn't talk about here, but now we can do optogenetics. So we can do electrophysiological recordings and we can record communication between two brain areas at the time of pair bond formation. And we can see that these two areas are communicating in sync at this time. And then we can recreate that, recapitulate that with uh, optogenetics and cause a pair bond. So these kinds of fancy things now that you can do in animals where you can specifically activate specific kinds of neurons that are projecting in a certain place and activate those terminals and uh, establish a behavior, we can get causality. Great, thank you. I have a question about, maybe I just didn't get that, but um, so what uh, is your, what the results you gathered so far, what, what does it like? Uh, does it help to understand autism more? Yes. Um, that would be well, okay. So we imagine the the first ten years that we were doing this work, we 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 never really thought too much about autism, right? Because we were trying to figure out how the brain works. Then um, Eric, what's his name? Hollander. Eric Hollander, where she was at, uh, did one of the first studies showing oxytocin improves repetitive behavior in autism, and now there's been there's probably 40 or so studies, even now with chronic intranasal oxytocin that show um, some benefit. And, but they're not doing it exactly the way that I think that it should be. They're not paying attention to the animal literature. They're taking it like a vitamin. And this is not, I would say it will not work this way. So what I try to do is to convince people based on our research with the animal that the way this will work is if you combine it with behavioral therapy, 
where you can clarify the social brain so that they can, the child can get it. So you know, it's it's not the case. If you if you're looking for animal research to instantly show within 10 years, you know, a treatment for a psychiatric disorder, it's not going to happen because the 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 clinical trials that are coming out now that are coming out with positive some positive results, but just not a cure, uh, were planned. 10 years ago, they go through all the ethical. And so now we have a better, you know, ideas of how this should be done. So I would expect that the studies that come 10 years from now, if they use it in the correct way, will have much better results. But the answer to your question is yes. The, the top um, therapeutic target for, oxy for autism is oxytocin. Okay. and. Um but do animals, those animals display autism-like syndrome? No, syndrome? and that's the cool thing about this is that you don't need to. So the, the, the point here is not to have an autism model. This is what I was saying earlier about NIMH. It's the wrong idea to say we need a model of schizophrenia, we need a model of autism. What we need is a model of social cognition. What we need is to, is to understand how does the brain process social information and how in, in which time does the brain maximally stimulate process social information. It's when a mother is nursing her baby and the molecules that are involved in that process. We can harness the power of those molecules that are involved in that process to improve social functioning in not just autism. I don't, it's not just about autism. It's about any disorder where there is a problem in processing social information. When social cues are not salient, if you want to make those social cues salient, then you would use autism. So psychiatry is moving completely away from the models of diseases. It's called the RDOC, Research Domain Criteria, something like that. It's like, it's, it's anxiety or social cognition or things like that. And so this molecule is about enhancing social cognition in whichever disorder. Okay, but can't we see that in humans already? That's yes, yes, many so papers. That's why many, I many don't papers. understand why we need uh, the Okay, because if, if you... Um, if you can see it in humans already, and then you say, we don't need to learn anything further, like say 10 years ago, you could see something in humans. And you say, okay, stop all animal research. Don't get a better idea, a better understanding of how the oxytocin system works. Then you're stuck there for 20, 30, 50 years. If, however, you now, as I was mentioning, we can put into a mouse brain and listen to the oxytocin neurons and see when they fire. Then suddenly I can see 20 years from now, we can have something that's even better. Like, so what, one of the studies that I'm, the research that I'm doing with animals, I have to do with animals first, is using other drugs that induce endogenous oxytocin release. That's going to be much better than um, the intranasal oxytocin that we're doing now, which we can't hardly get enough into the brain. So the next generation, the real treatments are going to be in the next generation. And there's not a country on this planet that will allow us to test the drugs that are that we can indu induce oxytocin release first in people. We need to find the drugs that induce the oxytocin release. And parent organizations are really wanting treatments for their children. And so it's not going to happen unless we get a better understanding of how the brain processes social information. Um, just one, one last comment on autism. Um, to my knowledge, um, it is still unclear what causes it. Right. And it's not that they don't produce oxytocin. No, exactly so right. That, so that's, that, that, I'm that glad I you brought this point up. And that's the beauty of this. Because what we are not, what we are not saying is autism is caused by a deficit in oxytocin. Therefore, let's replace what's missing. What we are saying is that when an individual takes oxytocin, then suddenly they process social stimuli much more profoundly, like a mother when she's nursing her baby. So it doesn't matter, even though there's a hundred causes of autism, hundred different genes that cause autism, the phenotype of autism is a lack of social cognition. So by any mechanism that you can improve social cognition, you will be able to treat autism. And the best way to do that, I believe, is like to recapitulate what happens when a mother is nursing her baby. Okay, but isn't it also an environmental problem? You know, it's, they talk about yeah. like pollution is the contributor yes. to autism. Yes, it's but not um, genetic. We, that, that is a, of a cause of autism. Yeah. So what we're trying to do now is when a child, when a parent comes to you 
and has a child with autism, what do you do? Okay, but it's also, I would say it's more important to try to even prevent autism, not... Uh, parents you know. with children would disagree. Yeah, I think we need both, but I think the prevention is, is key because the, the, the numbers are rising and we have to understand the disease, you know, so... Um, and one other thing, um, I was just uh, struck, so one area where I work in is refinement of animal experimentation, and I was wondering, the cages you showed, is that their normal home cage, or is, there, is this how they live? So, they, um, so you know how rats and mice, so the, uh, in ca mouse cages that normally host five mice, we house three bulls. <laughs> So, or in the, and then the breeders are in rat-sized cages. And they don't have any cover because when you oh, look yeah, at the have, na natural cover? environment. So they have big balls of cotton um, bedding, not, not cotton, but something that they, the squares that they use to, so they have an igloo, yes, they have an igloo with lots of bedding and uh, of the, lots of uh, the bedlets that they, nestlets and that they make a whole nest inside there and they stay inside that igloo. We used to use the alfalfa hay, mm -hmm. but that's very allergic. For, for whom? <laughs> for people, the people okay. who take care of the animals, Okay. the employees. Okay, and, and one last question about the humane uh, euthanasia. What, what is your method? The what? Uh, for euthanasia? Uh, CO2 asphyxiation is the US um, is, that's the approved method. If, if you don't mind, I would send you some papers on that because it's actually uh, highly discussed that it's not a humane method. And there's a lot of research actually from UBC um, mm -hmm. confirming that. It's one of the yeah, most, um, most uh, researched um, refinement areas is actually uh, carbon dioxide used in Asia that is actually not a humane method. What is the more humane method? Um, it, it, a better method would be to use um, one of the gases you use for um, anesthesia, for example, isofluorine. Isofluorine, yeah. Um, but, uh, or metfluorine or uh, metoxyfluorine or enfluorine. Those are better. But I can send you the papers if you're interested. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Melissa, ça, ça peut que continuer. Were there, were there things that you were meant, meant to say that I cut you off from? Oh, um, well, I just wanted to follow up on one of the points that, that Larry Young was making in response to the question. So in terms of thinking about treatment, um, it really, it, it, I would also argue that, you know, a more nuanced approach as opposed to giving it like a vitamin is really important when you think about it and you think about how oxytocin is acting in humans and in bulls. I mean, situations elicit oxytocin release in an adaptive fashion. So when it is required that you attend to social stimuli because that's an important thing, oxytocin promotes that. But sometimes it's not adaptive to do that. So if you just give a, a, a drug blanket, you know, you're not kind of targeting the precise situations in which it's going to be most important. And I think, um, so I agree with you that hopefully right. the next generation um, of researchers is going to be much more kind of targeted because that's the way it it works functionally. And then hopefully you can kind of instill some of these processes and these learning processes so that you'll actually prompt that behavior in the absence of actually administering the drug. Right, so based on you know my talk uh, and all the work that we've done, does it make sense to give oxytocin to a child with autism and then put them on a school bus to go to school? No. Yeah, that's the clinical trials that are coming out now that were formulated eight years ago and have gone through the, all the ethical approvals. So you know, you have to expect yeah. there's going to be these failures because mm -hmm. they're not doing it according to the way that it makes most sense from, from the scientific perspective. So exactly. this is why it's so critical to have, you know, communication between animal and human. Why are four times as many animal activists women? That's the thing that was for you. No, I'm just <laughs> it's for both of you. Well, I mean, maybe they are em more empathetic. More oxytocin? More responsive talk. I don't know. My my wife is uh, extremely empathetic towards everything that's not even things that are alive, like our rumba vacuum cleaner. She treats it like a child, <clears throat> and I just kick it over. Yeah.
Well, I think it has to do with, I mean, my view was what I was saying is that um, there are sex differences in the organization of the brain that maybe in females may be more oriented towards nurturing and empathy if empathy is related to maternal circuitry and taking care of things and things like that. That would be my guess. I, I don't know if that number is even true, but what number? that four times as many. Oh, four times as many. I don't I've know been that. keeping statistics at our uh, demonstrations, and I think it's an underestimate. I mean, I think there's still just, I can't speak to this particular answer this question, but in terms of empathy research and looking at gender differences in empathy, I think it's not as consistent as sometimes we might, we might, uh, oftentimes we don't observe gender differences when we measure empathic behavior or emotion contagion in a lab. Sometimes there'll be a slight but non-statistically significant difference. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure if the, the whole answer is simply that women are necessarily more empathic than men, although maybe our, maybe our measures just aren't. Uh, you know, cut out, cut out to test that. May I have a follow-up question on that? It, like when you studied the voles, did you notice that females have more oxytocin receptors? Did you count those? Can no, vol um, so in the voles, there's absolutely no sex difference in the amount of oxytocin or oxytocin receptors. And um, in humans, I don't think that there are oxytocin receptor differences either. So, um, so I, I don't think it's just necessarily oxytocin levels, but I think that there may be something about, um, I don't know, organization of the brain or something, I don't know. Okay, with that, I have to, I have to thank you because it's, the tape is just gonna okay. cut off otherwise. Thank you very much.